In 1986, Los Angeles' library burned down, but nobody remembers. Susan Orlean will be here to talk about why and about her latest book, The Library Book. What does it mean to blitz scale a business? Reid Hoffman, co-founder of LinkedIn and PayPal, and a Silicon Valley investor in just about every other major tech company, will join us to talk about his new book, Blitzscaling. Alexander Alter will give us an update from the publishing world. Plus, we'll talk about what we and the wider world are reading. This is the Book Review Podcast from The New York Times. I'm Pamela Paul. Susan Orlean joins us from San Francisco, where she is on book tour for her latest book, The Library Book. Susan, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me on. Before I get started, I want to say that everyone who does not own the library book should Google it just to see what it looks like, because not to be superficial, it is just it is a beautiful book. It looks like a library book. There is no dust jacket. It's just a a lovely object. And of course, you have your title, which must have been irresistible. It was hard to say no to that title. And this is the only book I've ever written where the title that we began with is the title that we ended with. And it was, there simply was no question along the way of using anything else. It It is nice that it is such a, a beautiful object since it in many ways celebrates the idea of of a book and of preserving a book as a book. Because this is a book about some of the occasional times when those books have not been preserved. Before I get into it, you just dropped such an interesting little tidbit that now I need to know what the original title of The Orchid Thief was. You're not going to believe it because it's so different. The original title was The Millionaire's Hot House. And I was really determined to use that title And I had to have my arm twisted a little bit to go with the orchid seat, which was my editor's idea. And when he first mentioned it to me, I said, that's the worst (laughs) title I've ever heard. So it just goes to show you, I now, anytime there's a question about a title, I feel like I should turn over the the decision making to my, my editor who's got a knack for titles that I evidently don't have. Well, clearly authors don't know anything about their books. So let's go back to the subject of this book. And it starts in a way on a very particular day, which was April 28th, 1986, which many people, if they remember at all, remember because of the Chernobyl explosion. But what happened in L.A. on that day? It started as a very ordinary day. The library opened at 10. There were about 200 patrons inside already. A fire alarm went off, which seems like it would be a disturbing event, but it was a very typical, a very common event at the L.A. library. The building, which was built in the 1920s, was in bad shape. It had much deferred maintenance. It had terrible wiring. So the fire alarm went off frequently and nobody took it very seriously. They all shuffled out of the building. Nobody went racing out. And they gathered on the sidewalk to wait for the fire department to make its usual inspection and reset the alarm and allow people back in the building. The only difference in this case was that the alarm would not allow itself to be reset. So the fire department went back in for a second look. When they came into the fiction stack, they noticed finally a little thread of smoke that was curling its way up the bookshelves. Within a very short amount of time, that little thread of smoke erupted into an enormous fire that burned for seven and a half hours, reaching a temperature of 2,000 degrees, and ended up burning entirely 400,000 books and damaging 700,000 more. Wow. It was the largest library fire in the history of the United States. And for until very recently, it was the largest structural fire in the history of Los Angeles. 
I want to talk a little bit about the fire itself as a as a somewhat fire obsessed person. I mean, how did this get so big so fast? Was it the fact that they didn't discover it right away? Was there something about the nature of this fire? Was it because of all of these dry books being perfect fodder for flame? The fire in the library had a couple of reasons for getting so fierce so fast. First is the fact that a fire in a library has unlimited fuel. It Nothing could be more attractive to fire than books, magazines, newspapers stacked seven stories high, which is what they were in in the L.A. library. Secondly, there was no sprinkler system. There was always a fear that that water was more destructive to books than fire. Mm -hmm. And the American Library Association had until that time recommended against sprinkler systems in libraries for that reason. The real cause, though, of it getting to be so intense was the structure of the book stacks themselves. They were the equivalent of a, a small concrete walled room that went seven stories high. In effect, it was a chimney. This, there was no division between the, the layers of stacks. They just had open metal grating between each floor of stacks. So the fire could go straight up. It was in a very compressed amount of space. So it just became absolutely fierce and burned from the bottom floor up to the top floor without anything breaking the progress of the fire. No ceilings, no division between these books in any way. When you give us those numbers, 400,000 burned, 700,000 damaged, it sounds immense, but how much of the collection was that? And was this a big collection in the grand scheme of sort of major metropolitan public libraries? L.A. was a pretty significant collection at that point. They had about a little over two million items in mm-hmm. the collection. So the destruction, the fire wrought, affected more than half of the collection. It was Part of what made it so devastating is that entire sections of the collection were gone 100 percent. For instance, L.A. had one of the largest collections on food and cooking in the entire country. That entire collection was gone. It had one of the only complete patent collections west of the Mississippi. That entire collection was destroyed. All of the fiction from authors A through L destroyed. So there were, were giant gaps left in, in the library's assets that simply were gone in a matter of a couple of hours. It was all gone. How did you get into this? I mean, you, you used to live in New York. You moved out to L.A. about seven years ago. What got you interested in this library fire? How did you find out about it? I had been toying around in my mind with the idea of writing about the life of a big city library because they seem like such amazing places. And I had had such a a profound remembrance of going to the library with my mom when I began taking my son to the little branch library in our neighborhood. So I was already primed to be thinking about libraries, but I, I just wasn't quite sure how... I would approach it beyond saying, wow, libraries are amazingly interesting places. Right. (laughs) I was being given a tour of the downtown branch of the library, which I had never been to. And quite honestly, I had barely ever been to downtown L.A. So it was all a revelation to me. As I was being toured through the library, the man who was giving me the tour stopped in front of one of the bookshelves and pulled a book off and smelled it. I was new to L.A., and I thought, I don't know, maybe this is a Los Angeles thing to <laughs> smell books. It, was, it just seemed so peculiar. 
And he said, you know, you can still smell the smoke in some of them. And I thought, God, I can't believe they let people smoke in the library. (laughs) And he said, no, no, it was from the fire, the big fire. And I said, what big fire? And he said, well, the big fire in 1986 that closed the library for seven years. He then, you know, moved on to show me something else. And I just stood there basically gobsmacked saying, what? What are you talking about? I, 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 I need to hear more about this. I think I came home and just said, I'm writing a book about this. Hmm. The most surprising thing you actually just said was that you were surprised that he smelled the book because I always smell books, especially in libraries, because they have those like old, outdated glue smells. And you know, it's probably very dangerous, but the libraries right. smell yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Highly uh, unrecommended. But. Right. <laughs> Well, it was, he smelled it in a way that was more like smelling something that smelled bad. Okay. So it wasn't just like your ordinary book sniffer. Right. I mean, where you open it up and you just take that deep, wonderful, luxuriating whiff of the smell of the pages. This was more like holding it between two fingers and smelling it as if it were unpleasant. One of the things I love about your books is that you not only dive deep into a subject, but you allow yourself to go on tangents. You you not only give into the tangents, but you celebrate them and and go in all different directions and, and find interesting characters. So I'd love to hear about some of them, starting with Mary Foy. Well, I loved learning about the history of the library, and I could have spent a lot of time with each one of these really distinctive characters. Mary Foy was one of the first city librarians. This was in the 1890s, at a time when women were barely allowed to use the library. They were restricted to a small reading room that was separate from the main room. She was 18 years old and was hired to be the head of the city library. I mean, how does that happen? She She... petitioned the mayor. She had some connection to the mayor through her father, but it was not, that alone didn't define why she got the job. I think she was very bright and very determined, and she didn't have any sort of higher education. And it was not typical to have a woman running anything, let alone a city department. But she appealed to the mayor He became convinced that she would do a good job. She was so young that her father would walk her to and from work because he didn't want her to walk alone. She was very well regarded by the patrons, who were all men, Hmm. and most of them were probably twice her age. She was very fierce as an administrator. She would walk around wearing a, a purse, a leather purse, kind of slung over her shoulder and She would fine people for if their book was laid, if they cursed, (laughs) if they wore a hat in the library, which was not permitted. So 18 years old, but fully possessed of her sense of power and authority in this institution, which was pretty extraordinary. She was then replaced by another young woman. And in fact, L.A. had women running the library at a time when that was a very unusual thing. Most librarians were men. Libraries have become, and librarians, and they've always been, but it seems to be an issue more of late, real forces in the movement for free speech and against the banning of books and and all of that. When did that start, or was that always there? It really has always been there. There certainly have been episodes where librarians were engaged in censorship of books and keeping certain books out of libraries. But by and large, it has always been a very progressive profession that sees free speech and the freedom of thought to be its primary purpose Mm -hmm. to both to bring people to 
the vast world of information and knowledge and narrative that exists and to make sure that those things are preserved and made available. So librarians have, have been very important in pushing back against the winds of repression and banning, and they've, they've almost always stood on the side of saying there should be access to information, even controversial in, information, and that's what a library does. There was an opinion piece that ran in The Times a couple of months ago by Eric Kleinenberg, a sociologist at NYU, about the importance of libraries, especially today, to help a sort of functioning democracy. Do you see it that way as well? I absolutely see it that way, and I I couldn't agree more. And this is one of the things that also is important to think about, that libraries are places. They're not merely a website, that they exist as a gathering place in a community where we encounter each other. And there aren't that many places that are free and open to everyone where we share things together as a community. And, and I, I really think that Eric was emphasizing the, the importance, the expansion of your sense of what community is that comes from sharing in a place like a library. I also think libraries are very personal spaces, especially for the readers, the real readers and the writers among us, that each of us has a library that we consider kind of our library, our own library, whether it's a childhood library or a library that maybe you, you wrote a book in or worked in or, or, or really became a reader. What's your library? For sentimental purposes, I still feel that the library I went to as a child, the Bertram Woods branch in the Shaker Heights Public Library System, which was really close to my house. I went there as a child with my mom a few times a week. It formed, it was certainly the first library I had ever gone to, and it formed my sense of what a library feels like and sounds like and smells like in a way that's really indelible. You knew libraries before, obviously, in a very personal way. Having written this book, having spent time in all of these libraries, is there anything that you now see when you walk into a library or notice that you didn't before? I'm so aware of, rather than just the patrons, which is what I think I noticed as as a person using libraries, now I see the wheels turning behind the scenes. I'm so conscious of, now that I know how libraries work and appreciate the fact that there are these complex institutions with so much going on that you don't see, simply getting the books on the shelves and, and around the building and cataloging them. So it's as if I feel as if they are a watch with a transparent back, and I can see the gears moving. What should we look for? Like those of us who don't know all of that about the inner uh, workings of the library, what would you recommend if someone were to walk into a library tomorrow, maybe someone who hasn't been to one in a while, to look for? Well, I think the real resource, the real gold, the real treasure in libraries is the librarians and the staff. They're not merely there to tell people to be quiet or to point you in a direction when you're trying to find something, but they're tremendous, knowledgeable people, many of whom develop expertise in a particular area, and they're there to be used, and they love it. They love being helpful more than just pointing you to a bookshelf. So I would say get in there and take advantage of of the people who are there and who love nothing more than to be helping people find what they're trying to find. All right. Well, one answer I didn't give away in this interview, and I will leave it to readers, is to find out who started that fire, if anyone, and why, and, uh, and what happened afterward. That I will leave for readers. Susan, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Susan Orlean's latest book is called The Library Book. Probably one of the best titles I can think of. Susan, thanks again. Thank you, Pamela.
So here's a request for our listeners. I get lots of feedback from you, some complaints, lots of kind words. Really appreciate it. You can always reach me directly at books at nytimes.com. I will write back. But you can also, if you feel moved to do so, review us on any platform where you download the podcast, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or somewhere else. Please feel free to review us and, of course, email us at any time. Reed Hoffman is in the studio now. He has, fittingly for one of the co-founders of LinkedIn, a fairly terrifying resume. He is the author of two previous bestsellers. We're going to talk about his latest book, Blitzscaling. But he is not only one of the co-founders of LinkedIn and currently executive chairman, but also one of the initial investors in Facebook and Zynga. He is a partner in the venture capital firm Greylock and on the board of Airbnb, Microsoft, and many other startups and global nonprofits. Did I get everything right, Reed? Actually, I'm no longer executive chairman. I'm only a board member of Microsoft. Ah, a board member of Microsoft. In any case, Reed, it's a pleasure having you here. Mm. And let's talk about this new book, Blitzscaling, but get there by way of talking first about your previous two books, because this is a kind of series. So the first book was The Startup of You. The second one was The Alliance. How do these all work together? The first book, I never really had planned on writing business books. The first book came about because I gave the commencement speech at my high school, the Putney School. And I was saying, what do I say to all these young high school students? What do I say from my personal experience about what matters to them? And it was that everyone needs to be the entrepreneur of their own life. The way that the world is changing, you actually have to have the skills of entrepreneur, just navigating your life, not starting businesses. Just Even if, if you're like a poet. Yes, exactly. Everything. And so it was like, all right. So I wrote the speech because commencement speech I write. And then people said, oh, you need to write the book. So we wrote the book. And then I was like, well, but this also makes a difference for how employees work with companies. And then mm-hmm. the alliance came out because it was – well, companies need to be hiring entrepreneurial people. They need to be promoting them. That's the way that companies will stay entrepreneurial. And so the alliance is that. And then blitzscaling is how do we build the massive scale new companies of the future? Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what makes it all a trilogy. I want to go back to the alliance for a second to talk a little bit more about that because that was about sort of reframing the relationship between employers and employees and employees amongst themselves. So the, the, the 1950s kind of Hudsucker proxy kind of view of, of employment was, well, you're, you, you join a company and you work your way up the company and it's a lifetime relationship with the company. And that's changed decades ago. And yet the employment management practice still tends to be that you come to the company and you're here forever. And the employee kind of goes, okay, I'm here forever. And you, what you have is the manager and the employee essentially lying to each other. Mm-hmm. That's trust erosion. The vast majority of people move on to other companies, and it's much better to collaborate, to say, hey, let's make this tour of duty, this gig that we're doing together, really amazing for both of us, for both the company and for the individual, for the employee. And if the manager and the employee has this as an honest conversation, Mm -hmm. it makes it much more powerful, and they can collaborate in much better ways, and it builds trust. So to presume from kind of the outset that an employee might be there for a gig, for a certain term of service. And indeed, actually, some of the managers and executives I work with now have that as part of their interview question. Mm -hmm. What's the gig you want next after this? Not necessarily at our company, but how is this transforming your career? But wouldn't there be a lot of fear around that for both on the employee side and the employer? And that, like, what does that mean for loyalty? The point about loyalty is to say, even though you may only have a gig at a company, the relationship between a manager and an employee and even a company and employee can be a lifetime relationship. And since the high likelihood is you are going to move on, if you did this in a way that you're collaborating, that you've made your gig at the company really good, then that's actually really good for both of you. Okay. Let's talk about blitzscaling. It's a word that I want you to define and talk about the etymology a little bit, because for those of us who are word people, and especially those of us who maybe are not, you know, working for a giant tech company, it's a little bit terrifying to think of the blitz in terms of our workplace. So it's a combination of a sports term, Mm -hmm. a blitz, an all-out effort, you know, like football and others, and uh, an intellectual parallel to the kind of the transformation of war that was in Blitzkrieg, Mm -hmm. which is this question of actually, in fact, going really fast and doing something importantly strategic in order to win a market. And the key thing about how our industry is evolving in a hyper-connected world is that more and more 
competition comes from everywhere. And the first prize is a Glengarry Glen Ross market. It's mm-hmm. the Cadillac. Second prize, steak knives. Third prize, you're fired. So the speed at being the first to scale is the thing that really matters. And this is how the industries of the future will more and more be created. And is this what we've seen with companies like Amazon, for example, and with it's just kind of customer acquisition, acquisition, expansion, and then we'll worry about sort of the the profit and the bottom line later? Uh, exactly. Although part of what we're learning is not to do it all the time, but to do it in the models that you can make it work later. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, in the first Internet boom, you had Webvan, you had All Advantage, you had – you know, a bunch of companies didn't work because they actually just could never put the business model together. Urban Fetch, that was my favorite. <laughs> exactly. But now you have Uber, mm-hmm. Airbnb, you know, Dropbox, Facebook, LinkedIn. And actually, in fact, these business models pulled together. And yet they, they did the same initial, you know, rocket ship takeoff of I'm totally focused on just expanding into the market. All right. I'm going to look at this from the perspective, not of the business itself, but sort of the uh, the larger economy. Does this kind of model then end up with sort of big monopoly players in each sphere? Or how do you how do you have competition when everyone is maybe blitz scaling? So I think it ends up with players that are dominant in certain markets, but those players are also competing with each other. Mm-hmm. Like if you go back to the 90s, there was one big tech company it was Microsoft. Well, now in the U.S. there's five, in China there's three. And my prediction 10 years from now is there will be double that. There will be even more. There will be Uber and Airbnb and all these others that are now also be big tech companies competing with each other. And that competition means that there is actually competition. It isn't kind of the anti-competition monopoly. But it does mean that they will be very strong in the market segment that they're in. All right, I'm not going to make you go through every step and bit of advice that you outline in your book, but just to give us a sense of, let's say you've decided I'm going to blitzscale my company. How does one go about doing this? We define blitzscaling as prioritizing speed over efficiency Mm -hmm. in an environment of uncertainty. And so what you do is you say, what's the set of things, the least most focused set of things that I can very quickly grow my customer base And put a whole bunch of other things into problems we solve later. Mm -hmm. That might be good management. That might be understanding my unit economics or my cost of acquiring customers. All of those things may be later problems. And all I'm trying to do is get my number of employees in, get my number of customers engaged. I may even be fixing customer service later. And it's a whole set of techniques for that. And do you need a lot of money to do this? I mean, is this something that a smaller, kind of leaner startup can do? Or does it require a lot of capital? Generally, you need what we call blitz capital. Sometimes that comes from revenue. That's like a Google case. More often than not, it comes from financial markets like Uber. All right. I'm going to bring this home for a second. What would you do like if you were the New York Times? Let's say that's your business. How do you blitz scale the New York Times? Traditional businesses can do this. Amazon did it with Amazon Web Services. Usually what happens is you take some area where you think you have a product and a product market fit that can scale to a very large size. And then you deploy a bunch of resources, capital, people, et cetera, in order to massively get the footprint of that size. Now, I don't know what the specific plan for the New York Times could be, but, you know, say, for example, it's like, well, actually, in fact, we have a whole set of different kinds of games with crosswords Mm -hmm. and we're going to build out a whole new game section. That might be an area where you blitz scale. All right. I'm going to get a little more specific because obviously I have an interest in this particular organization. But let's say you're the New York Times. One model of blitz scaling might be in terms of customer acquisition is to offer the news for free, which was the model for a long time. Now, we're not the only news organization that's moving away from that and towards a subscription model. Does Are those two concepts inherently at odds that you can't blitz scale if you have something like a subscription model? Uh, not necessarily. Actually, the freemium model where you have a bunch of free things in order to acquire and then get people to convert to subscription is a really good blitzscaling model. And actually, that's what the New York Times is iterated to. You still get a lot of articles for free. You can discover them on search engines like Google and Bing and others and and make that happen. But it's like, oh, now you've had 10 articles. Actually, you should subscribe now. That freemium model is a blitzscaling model. Can you take one specific from your book from the sort of blitzscaling plan and apply it to the New York Times and what you would do? Well, I think perhaps on the business model section, if I were doing the New York Times, but this is, you know, an outsider, I might actually add in digital goods. I might add in a way of saying, hey, I can actually, in fact, buy kudos or flowers for Mm -hmm. articles that I particularly liked. It's another version of freemium where I can encounter something where I might have gotten there for free, but then I can contribute and participate. And I might actually use that 
as a model across a lot of the digital properties in the New York Times. All right. Here's something you may have thought about because you are, in addition to being an investor and on the board of all of these companies, an author, a three-time author now, a two-time best-selling New York Times best-selling author. If you were an author, how would you blitz scale your sort of brand, maybe combining the lessons of the startup of you with the lessons of blitz scaling? Well, I'm doing some of that with the Blitzscaling book. You know, we created a, a kind of a PowerPoint mm-hmm. of kind of like what the concepts of the book are, and we put that out. We get a bunch of, like one of the things we'll be doing over the next month or two is having conversations about the book with a number of different people. Part of my prep for doing the book was starting a podcast called Masters of Scale. Yes. And that was actually, in fact, not just generating the book, but it's kind of the Blitzscaling on the entire kind of book and media and author way of doing it. Don't just do it afterwards. Start two years in advance as a way of doing this. And all of those are part of how do you uh, blitzscale and change the kind of media ecosystem around books. This is part of your terrifying resume, which is we didn't mention at the outset, but you were, you not only graduated from Stanford, you were a Marshall Scholar at Oxford. You originally wanted to be an academic, but as I understand it, thought I don't want to write books for, you know, only 50 or 60 people. But you are a book person. What did you want to do in academia? What kind of books did you imagine writing then? My mission is how do I help humanity evolve? And by evolve, I mean like compassion, wisdom, the kind of things that we treat as our aspirational characteristics. And I wanted to write books that would help with that. Mm -hmm. Like, how is it that we can become better instances of the human beings that we would want to become? And uh, that was actually what kind of attracted me both to my studies, you know, kind of cognitive science, artificial intelligence, and also what attracted me to, ooh, I could be that as an academic. And then I realized that the obvious, you know, maybe this is a kid, I should have known this sooner, that, the, that academia is about scholarship, and I, mm-hmm. I value scholarship, but what I really cared about is the evolution of humanity. What do you read in your spare time? Do you read business books, or what else do you read? Uh, I read a few business books, but more often it's uh, things like Sapiens or Homo Deus. You mm-hmm. know, Yuval Harari. Exactly. Most recently, I've been rereading a book that I loved as an undergraduate, uh, Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death, because I've been kind of re thinking what the lessons from that are to the modern world of social media. Yeah, that's newly timely. What did you learn? Well, I'm still in the process. I literally just picked it up last week again because I was like, oh, yeah, I should go back to that. And and as a kind of this metaphor of the history of America told in cities and, you know, is that are are we still in Las Vegas Mm -hmm. is kind of the way that public discourse works. And I think that the key question is, can we can we this is a little bit less of what Postman was saying, but can we shift it in a way that the entertainment of discourse can actually lead to our better selves in humanity? And what's the way we would do that? That's the thing I've started asking myself the question. The books that you're citing are books that have an argument, but they're also very narrative in terms of their structure. How do you approach writing a business book? Do you think about narrative or do you think, you know, no, this has to be kind of in very discrete chunks? Like, does storytelling play a part? I myself am more naturally a theorist, mm-hmm. so I first kind of generate the theory, the, the frameworks, the concepts, the what is the theory of the world, what is the theory of human nature, how is that changing, what happens? But I know that, you know, to some degree, you know, homo sapiens is homo narrativus, right? And that the way that things are approached is the story around it. And so then I say, okay, well, what's the way that people can access this theory through the narrative? Can you recommend, I can't let you leave our studio without asking this question, especially for people who maybe don't necessarily read business books. Can you recommend a business book other than your own that you would say, you know what, anyone could get something out of this? Hmm. The anyone is an interesting challenge. The kinds of other things that I think are interesting in like a business book arena are like Joshua Cooper Ramos' Seventh Sense which is kind of networks about how it applies the, the new world of networks and what that means. Nicholas Taleb's Anti-Fragile, which is how do we build these new systems in which they're robust. And, you know, it's kind of a combination intellectual and business book. Mm-hmm. But there's a variety of those which are really stunningly interesting and aren't the normal just kind of how-to that people expect of business books. All right. Last thing, I want to give you the opportunity to do your sort of elevator pitch for blitzscaling. The reason why blitzscaling is interesting is that this is how companies of the future are going to be built because all companies are going to become more and more technology companies and this is the way that technology companies are built. So it'll transform industries, transform societies, 
and create the jobs of the future. And this is kind of the playbook for how that changes. And I think it's worthwhile for everyone to understand. Even for poets. Even for poets. Excellent. I also want to mention that you have a co-author on this book and your previous book, The Alliance, Chris Ye, who is not here today. But the book, again, is called Blitzscaling, The Lightning Fast Path to Building Massively Valuable Companies. It is by Reid Hoffman, our guest, along with Chris Ye and a forward by Bill Gates. Reid, thank you so much. It's great being here. Alexander Alter joins us now with some news from the publishing world. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, Pamela. So we're here to talk about a different format of books. Yes, it was really interesting to learn about this format that's really popular in Europe. I'm not going to attempt the Dutch pronunciation, but there are these tiny horizontal books with a hinge that you can open up and flip with one hand. They've become popular all across Europe, and they've sold about 10 million copies. And I'd never heard of them before. It's really unusual to see kind of innovation in print because, well, there's been a ton of innovation in ebooks and audio. You know, print has pretty much been the same for thousands of years. You know, ever since the Codex, there's the paperback. But what else are you going to do? You've got a book that's bound. So I I first heard about these recently because uh, Dutton Books for Young Readers is doing new editions of four of John Green's novels. He's, of course, the incredibly popular author of The Fault in Our Stars. And they are trying out these tiny editions, which, as I mentioned, you know, are already popular in Europe. And that's how his publisher found out about them because they got some copies sent to them of his Dutch books in this little format and decided, well, these are, I've never seen this before. Let's try it here. What are we talking about in terms of size? It can fit in the palm of your hand. It's the size of a smartphone. You can hold it one hand with one hand and sort of flip it and hang on to a subway pole with the other hand, which I tried the other day. It worked so pretty like well. So it's like a flip phone, but a flip book. Exactly. Got it. And is that deliberate? Are they trying to appeal to the sort of digital generation of well, readers? Well, I think, you know, they the, the design was already kind of in place from this Dutch printer that innovated this form in 2009. But I think when they saw it, John Green's editor, Julie Strauss-Gable, thought, well, he's got all these young readers, and young readers are not as set in their ways in terms of what they expect a book to look like. And I do do think they thought, you know, people who grew up with smartphones and things could, could be comfortable holding a book like this. It's sort of it takes a moment to readjust. I think this, the strangest thing isn't just the size, but the fact that they're horizontal. So your brain, you know, has to reorient. But once you do, it's a pretty, it's a pretty fun experience. Like when you say it's horizontal, what do you mean? So I mean that the, the axis of the book is like, imagine you had a John Green book in front of you in a normal format. Flip it over so that you're flipping the pages Upwards, got yeah. it. So it's like a like a like a steno pad or exactly. something. Exactly, and what that allows them to do is to get longer sentences onto the page. So it's a more natural reading experience than say if they had tried to use the same orientation, you would have much shorter sentences, and it would be kind of jammed together. Now, for our older listeners who might be wondering, is the typeface also smaller? It is a bit, but it's very legible, and they worked really hard to get the spacing right. They were measuring things in millimeters, so it's not actually a tiny type. It's it's a pretty standard or close to standard size type. I didn't really notice much of a difference, which I thought was pretty interesting. Now, the small format overall has been, it's been around a while. They were used right during World War II. There exactly. were these great little books that could be easily carried by soldiers and were produced inexpensively, right? Exactly, yeah. So there have been, I think, over the decades, publishers have kind of experimented with smaller paperbacks. There were the pocket books. Those were sold in drugstores and department stores. And as you mentioned, the Armed Services Edition, which were these miniature paperbacks, which actually helped create a whole new audience for mass market paperbacks. But, you know, in the, in recent decades, there hasn't been really a brand new print format before. And when I spoke to John Green about why he wanted to be a guinea pig for this format in the U.S., that was what really excited him. He said was the idea that they could innovate and actually introduce a new print format. And he said... You know, as a book nerd, he loves anything to do with physical books and beautifully designed books, and he just thought it was a really exciting idea. So they're actually committing quite a bit to this. I mean, it was a really elaborate process to get the English editions done, and they're printing 500,000 copies, which is, yeah, that's a significant run, and you're, you know, you're expecting then that this will take off. And what's interesting is 
you know, Dutton is part of Penguin, of course, and that's part of Penguin Random House, the largest publisher in the U.S., and they're using this as a test case, but their plan is to introduce many more of these in coming years. They're going to try classics, you know, commercial authors, adult authors. And I think the the notion is not to introduce like a brand new work of fiction in this format because you need an audience there already. These are books that are designed to already hold appeal to people. These are things that you would collect and sort of show off, you know, new editions of books you already own and love, basically. There was, Penguin has done this already. I remember around their 60th birthday, they did, they did these great little books called Penguin 60s, which sold for 60p. This was in the oh, mid to right. late 90s in, in the UK. And then they brought them over here, editing slightly the ones that they reproduced because um, some, some of the British ones were more uh, sort of clearly uh, for that market. Um, and they sold here for a dollar. And I recently saw that they did these Penguin Modern editions of them. So they're not all flip books, right? No, I think I think that's what's really interesting and different about these books. It's not just a shrunken down version of, of a book. It's an actually sort of different design. But it, I have seen other examples of smaller books. And you mentioned Penguin. Picador also released some batches of smaller books that they did that to mark their 20th anniversary, the 20th anniversary of their Picador Modern Classics series. So they released novels by Dennis Johnson, Jeffrey Eugenides, Herman Hesse, and Marilyn Robinson in this mini format. So the experiment was so successful for Picador that they actually extended it and they did another crop. They did another collection of nonfiction titles by prominent women. So they had a memoir by Hilary Mantel and works by Susan Sontag, Joan Didion, and Barbara Ehrenreich. And when I spoke to their publisher, apparently those were pretty popular with independent booksellers just because they're these adorable, you know, beautifully designed little yeah. books that you can kind of prop up on the counter next to the register. And they have sort of gone beyond, you know, traditional retail a little bit. You see them being sold in museums. And I think, you know, Penguin has high hopes that the John Green books could make their way into stores like, I don't know, Anthropology or Urban Outfitters or some design stores. And given the size, I could see, you know, this being something that that took off, you know, in, in broader retail beyond just bookstores. All right. So smaller size, smaller prices, too? Not in significant prices, but they are about, the, I would say, a standard paperback size. The mini versions of John Green's novels will be sold for $12 each, or you can get the whole box set of all four for $48. Bargain. All right. Thanks, Alexander. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Joining us now to talk about what we're reading, we have my colleagues Greg Coles and John Williams, as well as special guest star Taffy Brodesser Ackner. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi, Taffy. Hello. Taffy. All right. Let's start with you, Greg. I'm reading a German novel by Jenny Erpenbeck called Go Went Gone. In the broad outline, it almost sounds like an Ann Tyler kind of a novel. It's a, <laughs> it, it's about like an idle, retired intellectual um, who's trapped in his mind and then drawn gradually um, and then urgently into the wider community. And so that's all very kind of Ann Tyler-esque. But it's also written with this kind of cool, steely chilliness. Intellectual. Yeah, mm-hmm. in, intellectual vibe that gives it almost more like Jam Kotsea um, or, or something like that. I, I only laughed because I also sort of started this book recently and I— I love Ann Tyler, but it is definitely not <laughs> no, an Ann it's, Tyler. it's not. I mean, it doesn't have any of that kind of warmth. Or, I mean, she, honestly, she can sometimes be a little bit twee, and there's nothing twee about this book at all. It's a book about the European refugee crisis, so a little bit exit west, also, but but not magical. It's this retired professor, intellectual, who is gradually and then urgently gets involved with a group of African refugees um, in Germany. And you said it's a German novel. Was this written in German? It was written in German. It's translated by Susan Bernofsky. Um, It seems like a, a very good translation. Um, again, it it's a book that very intentionally, I think, holds you at a bit of a distance. Mm-hmm. It, it holds you at a remove. And so it's it's a hard book to warm up to. I think the Katsaya comparison is, yeah, is really good. That, Better it, than the Ann Tyler is what you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, it, it actually reminds me a lot of Katsaya's book, Disgrace, because like that book, it takes this individual story and cracks it open to be kind of about history and politics. Um, there, there's very kind of angry undertone to it. Um, it's it, it doesn't let you escape the implications of foreign policy and its effect on human lives. When did it come out? It came out in 2017. We reviewed it last year, but late in the year. So I'm just getting around to, to reading it now. So it's very much about this moment. Oh, yes, very much so. 
All right. You're also reading an of-the-moment book, John. Well, I'm trying to catch up a little bit on on this year's big books because, um, you know, several of them slip past me as they come out. So I, I, Behind, I, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So over the weekend, I read uh, There, There by Tommy Orange. And which I think probably everyone has heard of at this point. We had a couple of really smart reviews of it in the Times, and we also had a, a really good profile of Orange written by Alexandra Alter that kind of opened out and to also talk about the larger trend of the new generation of Native American writers. This is a novel told from the perspectives of at least a dozen characters as they live in Oakland, California, and elsewhere, and all make their way to Oakland for this big annual powwow. It's very good. It's very energetic. It's really smart. He starts with a prologue that's sort of told from just the perspective of Native Americans in general. It's Mm -hmm. a bold move. It doesn't really get into a specific character yet. The book, for me, I I, I don't want to say it falls apart, but the last third of the book, as they all get to the powwow, there are so many moving pieces and so many characters you've met that it it kind of ricochets between them a bit too quickly for me and becomes a, a, a drama, almost like a criminal drama that I wasn't that interested in. But the individual pieces before that are really moving and and well drawn. And I think that if it's maybe – I give it points for its ambition. Sometimes ambition can get in the way of a book. But I think in this case, it actually makes it a better, more enriching read. And I definitely think it's an essential new book. Speaking of ambition, I wanted to interject that my comment about John always being behind on what he's reading <laughs> is completely <laughs> ironic because at the end of the year, John always shows up everyone on the book review desk by publishing online the list of everything he's read that year. And it's always like this extremely upsettingly yeah. long <laughs> list. A lot of your colleagues resent it. Yeah. <laughs> so we're just letting you know now. They just the tend podcast. to be older things, but I'm catching up on 2018. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Taffy? I am reading The Knicks by Nathan Hill. And for the past couple of years, I've been both writing my own novel and I was doing a story about Jonathan Franzen, which necessitated reading all of his work all over again. And I'm a slow reader. And when I started reading this, it's about it's it's about a lot of things, but it's, it's not about, about basketball. We should say the Knicks is N-I-X. It, yeah N I X. It's N I X, and I started reading it. It's about a um, a woman who who was radical in the '60s who left her child, and who it's about a lot and the son, and it has the kind of brutality of Franzen and the yarny tangent. Ness, that's a word, right? Of, <laughs> of like John Irving, mm-hmm. and it is, and every sentence. Now that I'm in my novel edits, because I was also writing a novel, like fills me with rage and anger, and I still can't look away. And over the weekend, frankly, I'll say it, I wrote him a letter saying that I resent his book <laughs> and that I hate him. And I know as a writer that that's the kindest thing another writer can say to you. So, <laughs> I hate you. I hate you for writing this better t- than me. Yeah, this is this, and like every sentence is just every description, the command over it. It really like. It, it really brings me to my knees. When you're working on a novel, do you find that reading other novels is, is helpful or is it a hindrance? Like, do their voices start to infect your own or start you to rethink what you did? Or Yeah. It, they, <laughs> I, I tried not to read any novels. And probably the worst thing I ever did was read all of Franzen while I was writing my own novel. And sometimes when I was writing my novel, I'd be like, maybe that Franzen is getting in there somehow. And I'd pick up the corrections and be like, oh, no, no. This is still much better. (laughs) (laughs) When I was writing my first book a long time ago, I, for reasons not that interesting to go into, mostly curiosity, I picked up Peggy Noonan's What I Saw at the Revolution. Mm -hmm. And she has a very particular voice, which we all know very well because we heard it all in Reagan's speeches. Um, And it's it's a catchy voice. It's an infectious voice. It's an influential voice, which is, I think, also why Reagan's words had such an impact. But it's not necessarily the one that we all want in our own books. And yet I found myself like, you know, unexpectedly and almost without any command going back and like Peggy Noonanizing my prose until I like wow yeah that's yeah. why your first book was called Morning in America <laughs> <laughs> she um, ghost wrote it what are you being influenced by now we, we, we're 
we're all very contemporary. I have a feeling you're taking us back in time. <laughs> I Yeah, I'm taking us back in time, but only part way because I did a rare thing, which is that I, I put down the book that I was reading with great reluctance and joy because I really hated it. I started reading Rudyard Kipling's Kim for my book club, and, and I was not there when it was assigned. I'm not sure why it was assigned. In fact, I had lunch with the woman who did assign it, and when I asked her, why did you pick this? Because it's not a children's book. And my book club is only children's books, even though it features a a protagonist who is a child. And she said, I don't know. And now I have to reread it. Um, (laughs) And I'm not sure why I did this. And in fact... She did not show up for the book club meeting, which was on, uh, oh, yes, this that's week. That's aggro. Yeah. 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 Tuesday. She had a good excuse. However, I think that not a large group among our members showed up, and we think it was because of this book. Some people uh, didn't show up and sent emails really uh, explaining how much they hated the book. And the most reassuring thing for me was that no one else liked the book, and only one person finished reading it. Everyone else put it down, which never happens in this book club or rarely happens. Of the group that showed up on Tuesday night, one is a publisher, two are English teachers, and two are agents. And the only one who finished was the publisher. And again, he really did it only out of spite. Um, it's, <laughs> and it's a book I wanted I wanted to like. I actually like Kipling's short fiction. And I'm one of those people who feels obliged for whatever unknown reason that probably only a good therapist could get at. Mm-hmm. I feel obliged to read all of those books that one should read. And this is a book that is beloved among, you know, especially among the English. Uh, I think that there's probably a lot of like really creepy be colonial nostalgia in that in that love. But people have very fond memories of it. And my edition, which was this beautiful folio edition that I immediately spilled coffee on, um, <laughs> had a nice introduction by Jan Morris, the wonderful travel writer, in which she compared it to Don Quixote. And I thought, you know, this is going to sort of be part of my c- canonical catching up. It's a terrible book. I just, <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I really just liked it. I could not get into it. it. It, it, I hated it, interestingly, in a way that I hated the Pickwick papers, which is was also written in serial format. This was written for McClure's magazine. And it it had that kind of very insular British, like, we're going to have these kind of stock characters that all of we Brits know who these people are. So there's a lot of humor in it that completely went past me. And I, I mean, I didn't even crack a smile once in the in the, I don't know, 120 pages that I read of it. But to tell you what it's about, for those who are now tempted to pick it up themselves. Is there anyone? (laughs) (laughs) Anybody? Right. Have any of you read Kim? No. 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 But now I'm never going to. (laughs) Well, you know, people today, it's a controversial novel because, of course, they're, you know, especially if you look at it outside the context of its time, people consider it to be, you know, a kind of abhorrent racist colonial novel. Leaving that aside, which wasn't what what troubled me so much as the writing and the story and the total lack of... Of stakes and direction. It's it, a real grab bag. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I thought, I, I thought, okay, I will read it as a historical document, if nothing else. So what it did well was it definitely captured the kind of tapestry of Indian society at that time. You know, the fact that you could, it's a its a journey novel in which a, a, um, a an orphaned son of an Irish soldier, Kimball O'Hara, who goes by the name of Kim, has basically ended up an Indian street kid and uh, comes across as Indian and speaks Hindi as his native language. He can speak English, but actually not, not, it's not his first language. And he befriends a traveling Tibetan Lama and they go on this kind of pilgrimage the Lama is trying to free himself from the wheel of things by finding the original um, river of the arrow. So it's this journey where they travel through India, running across sort of the various figures in Indian society at the time. And you come across the mixture of different religions and ethnicities that were in India at the time. The historical backdrop is is the Great Game, which was the ongoing battle over territory between the Brits and the Russians. So all of that sounded very good, but it's not. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I hate it book. already. Escaping yeah. the wheel of things sounds good. <laughs> I have two comments about your book club. One, it sounds very intense. Two, I don't think it's okay for people to email their feedback. That's very interesting. I'm going to send that along. Um, Um, You can, unless those are people who can potentially 
publish my work in the future, in which case... <laughs> Those are people that can I'm, potentially publish your work in the future. Tell them it's great. I also don't think it's okay <laughs> to basically roll a tear gas canister into the group and then run away. Like, the person recommended Kim... <laughs> Did not finish it. And then totally disappeared. (laughs) Well, she is the founder of the book club, and she's a very regular attendee and is probably listening to this podcast. So we'll let her have it. We'll let her have it. But, but, uh, Kipling won the Nobel Prize. He did. Yes. Yes. One of the most controversial Nobel Prize winners, at least nowadays. Yes. So I cannot recommend it. I am interested in hearing from those who would recommend it from any defenders please feel free to email me um, and I will respond. And I thought before we ended here, I would pose a question that came from one of our email correspondents and listeners. This is from Andrew La Riviere, who is in Mandeville, Louisiana. And he asks, are you and your colleagues ruthless when reading a book for personal pleasure? For example, if you are not liking it, do you just move on to the next thing, thinking life is too short for a bad, boring read and I'm on to better things? Just curious. So I think I've answered that question, but I'd like to throw it out (laughs) to you guys. For me, I stop reading things. I have a very low threshold for not reading things, and I, but I hate the time wasted. And I always hope that a book has a great ending. So I, li- I do that, but I live with a lot of regret. <laughs> when I was younger, say up until my mid-20s maybe, I felt this weird obligation to finish things. Even contemporary things that I would pick up and not enjoy. I just felt like there was something maybe to develop your critical faculties or know why you didn't like things was felt as important to me as, as liking things. But now I definitely realize – as I get older, how short life is. And I, I will ditch something very quickly if I'm not enjoying it. Or if I don't feel like it's doing something, you know, interesting, even if I'm not loving it. Any books you're willing to name? Any books I'm willing to name. Oh, God, sure. But I, none are really popping to mind right now. But I'll, I'll think about it and come back next week with a few. All right. Okay. John, Greg, thank you so much. And our special guest star, Taffy brodesser Ackner. If you have not read Taffy's great profiles, she is a, a writer for the magazine here and for our culture section. You will definitely finish them if you start them, and whether it's <laughs> nice. Matt Paltrow or Jonathan Franzen. So, Taffy, thanks so much for being here, too. Thanks for having me. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books, and you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. I write back. The Book Review Podcast is produced by Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media, with the great help of my colleague, John Williams. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. Pamela Paul.